an important application of the derivative is to motion in a line. So what do we have here? Before we had a function f of x, now we're going to consider s of t. t is going to represent time, and s of t is going to represent the position of your object at time t. So think of it this way. I'm going to have a line. It's going to be either horizontal or vertical. There's going to be a bug that lives on this line. At each time t, I'm going to take a snapshot of the position of the bug on the line. That's how we're going to get our function. So if I wanted to graph this, what would we do? Well, where we had the x-axis before, we're now going to call that the t-axis. And then the y-axis will stay as it is. And now we just plot points like we did before. A plot for your curve is just going to be t comma s of t. So that's motion in a line. Another way to think of this could be sitting in your car and just driving forwards and backwards. You're not allowed to turn and just mark off whatever position you're at. Okay, so we want to work derivatives into this. So the idea is going to be some of the concepts we had before. So secant line, in this case, what would we do? We take two points in time, evaluate the position function at those, and then we're just going to take the change in the position over the change in time. So that's what we're going to call average velocity. So average velocity is the same as taking your two points, connecting the dots, and then taking the slope of that secant line. Now, we can apply all of our machinery, the derivatives to this. So if we take the limit as the change in time goes to zero, that's going to give me the derivative of our function s. That's what we're going to call the instantaneous velocity. So that'll be the slope of the tangent line to our graph at our point t. Let's take a look at vertical motion. So suppose I have a rocket. We fire it up into the air. It keeps going up until gravity overcomes it, and then it brings it back straight down. So what's going to happen here? Well, let's suppose I have some conditions. So say we're firing it from a cliff that's 50 feet high. The initial velocity is going to be 100 feet per second. So that's going to be your instantaneous velocity at time equal to zero. And then note, gravity is going to be a given. That's going to be minus 32 feet per second squared. So gravity has a minus sign because what gravity does, if you're going up, gravity is working against you. It pulls you back down. So it's actually aimed in the negative direction. We'll see later how to get the equation for this. The equation is going to be s of t equal to 50 plus 100t minus 16t squared. So that's your position function. All right, let's work out an average velocity. So find the average velocity between time equals zero, and time equal to 3.125. Okay, why 3.125? We're seeing in a second that that's gonna be where the peak occurs. That's as high, that's the time where you reach your highest point. Now, what do we do? Well, we're gonna take our change in position over change in time. Our change in time is gonna be from zero to 3.125, so the difference of those is 3.125. For the change in position, I'm going to have to evaluate my times through the position function. So that's going to give me, you put a 0 in, you get a 50. If you put 3.125 in, you have to go to your calculator. That's going to give you 206.25. So stick them into our equation for slope of a secant, and then that's going to give me 50 feet per second. So that says if somebody basically measured what you were doing at time equal to 0, time equal to 3.125, didn't care about what happened in between. You just take one snapshot, measure your position, take your, another snapshot, measure your position. From that, we can get your average velocity. Now let's see how we get that maximum height. So since I have the equation of a parabola, I can complete the square. So let's take a look at this. So what do we want to do? First thing I want to do is I can move the 50 away from everything. And then I want to factor out 16 from the 100 so I can isolate the term with the t squared in it. So that's going to be right here. Once I have that t squared minus 6.25t, what's the rule for completing the square? You take one half what's in front of the t. You're going to have t minus that in parentheses squared. Then I'm going to square that thing. And we're going to subtract that off. So the rule is if I have x 
plus 2ax, completing the square turns that into x minus a, quantity squared, minus a squared. So we do that. So we're going to get this here. I push everything through. That's going to simplify to 206.25 minus 16 times quantity t minus 3.125 squared. So now if you notice, that second part, that's always going to have a negative sign there. So the idea would be the biggest I could get would be where I get that second term equal to zero. We'll never get a positive. So once I have it equal to zero, I've hit my max. That'll be equal to zero precisely when t is equal to 3.125. So our maximum is going to be at time 3.125 seconds. And then that height is going to be what comes out when you put that in there, or 206.25 feet. All right, since we have a derivative floating around, we have an easier way to get to our answer now. So if you notice, what's happening? I'm going to throw something up in the air. It's going to go up, it's going to stop, and then it's going to come back down. So that's a real important point there. When it goes up, before it can change direction, it has to stop. Okay, when it stops, that means the instantaneous velocity is going to be equal to zero. So, what we can do then is, I can take my equation for position, I can take its derivative, I can try to find out where it's going to be equal to zero. If I take its derivative, what are we going to get? The 50 goes away, 100t becomes 100, and then that minus 16t squared becomes minus 32t. The note here, we're probably used to doing derivatives with x, but whatever the variable is going to be, that's what we're going to take the derivative with respect to. So here, it's going to be with respect to t. Now, I have an equation I can solve. We're going to have 100 minus 32t is equal to 0. That's going to give me my t equal to 3.125. You notice it's going to agree with what we got when we completed the square. Next problem, find the instantaneous velocity at t equal to 2. Once you have that, approximate the position at time equal to 2.3. Okay, we have our velocity function from the previous problem. So all I need to do is stick 2 in there, and that'll give me the instantaneous velocity. So v2 is just going to be equal to 100 minus 32 times 2, which gives me 36 feet per second. To approximate position at 2.3, what am I going to have to do? Well, remember, Velocity is derivative of the position function, so that's going to be the slope of the tangent line to the position function's graph. So that's going to be the slope of my tangent line, that 36 feet per second. So all I need is a point to get an equation of the tangent line. I'm going to take our point at 2. So I put 2 into the equation. What's that going to give me? That's going to give me 186 when you work it out. So now I have an equation of a tangent line. It's going to be y minus 186 feet equals 36 feet per second times t minus 2 seconds. I can push the 186 to the other side, and now I can put a 2.3 in there to get our approximation. So our approximation winds up being 196.8 feet. We check against the actual value. I get that by taking 2.3, put it into the position function. That's going to give me 195.36 feet. So we see our approximation is pretty close.